Today we want to derive the supply curve, the upward sloping relationship between the price and the quantity supplied in the market. To do that, we're going to start by looking at individual firms and showing how they make decisions about how much to produce, and then we're going to add up the decisions of all the individual firms in the market. So to get started, imagine that you are a CEO, chief executive officer of a really small firm. In fact, why don't we make the firm be a firm? Suppose you have a plot of land and that you've already paid for, you got the plan, you, you land, you're going to decide how much you're going to grow. And of course, to grow, produce, you have to hire workers to help you. Obviously, the more output you have, the more workers you'll need. So more workers means more output, more output of, of uh, your farm output. Let's say it's pumpkins. And of course, you've got to pay the workers too, and that's going to be part of your costs. Now, don't forget, there's going to be many other firms in this market with you because this is a competitive market with lots of competitors, a lot of other firms producing. You're going to decide how much to produce. And in order to determine how much can you're going to produce, you want to look at the price in the market, and then you decide. So there you are, a farmer with pumpkins, deciding how many pumpkins to produce. If the price of pumpkins is a dollar a pound, how many should you produce? If it's two dollars a pound, how many should you produce, etc. Now when we make this decision and think about the decision of the CEO, we're going to apply the basic mantra of economics, the general economic principle that people make purposeful choices with limited resources. In the case of the firm, the firm is going to be thinking about its decision, the firm is the people, it's going to try to maximize profits, that's what we mean by make purposeful decisions, and it's going to be constrained by what we'll call a production function, which relates the amount of output to inputs or the amount of output of pumpkins to the input of workers. So that's the idea. We apply this basic principle, people make purposeful choices with limited resources, which we've considered before, and now we're going to apply this by saying that firms maximize profits with a production function that relates how much they produce to how much they put into the process. We're going to think about the firm as maximizing profits, so that means we need to define profits. Profits are pretty easy to define. It's just the difference between what you uh, take in and selling something and what it costs to produce. That is total revenue minus total costs. Total revenue, in turn, depends on the price and how much you actually sell. We can call it price and quantity, P times Q. P times Q is revenue. The higher the price, the larger the revenue. The more you sell, the higher is Q, the larger the revenue. You can also think of the total cost as the cost of everything you need to produce the product. That is the cost of the land, the cost of the equipment, and the cost of the workers. That's the total cost. When we think about this decision of the farmer deciding how much to produce, it's really important and sometimes confusing to recall that this assumption of competition means that all the firms, all of the farmers in this market are price takers. That is, they look out in the market and they see what the price of pumpkins is one dollar, two dollars, whatever it happens to be, and then they make a decision on how much to produce. Now this may seem a little strange as an assumption sometimes, because you could think of firms, farmers, setting the price for their product. But effectively, in a competitive market, they really have to take the prices given. If they charge much more than the going price in the market, then no one will come and buy pumpkins from them. If they charge a price which is lower, then they're just throwing money away. So effectively, as, as long as there's lots of firms competing, they take this price as given. When you see a, a sign posted, like 14 cents per pound, you want to think about this farmer as taking that price as given, and it can't deviate much from that. Now, given that assumption, we want to now make, go through and think about the decision of how much to produce at this farm. Let's be specific and say the decision is how many crates of pumpkins to produce, and we'll give an example where the price of crates is, is specified. And here's our example. So we first want to find the total revenue, and then find the total costs, and of course then find the profits. So let's look at the example. The number of crates produced of pumpkins is on the first column there. You can see one, two, three, four, five. And the amount of revenue is going to depend on the price. If the price, for example, is $35, as in the second column, then the 
revenue from selling one pumpkin is $35. The revenue from two pumpkins is $70, and so on. If the farmer has a price out there in the market, it's just $70 a crate, then one crate will give $70, two crates will give $140, etc. If price is $100, then obviously two crates is $200, or five crates is $500. So that's revenue. Now let's think of costs. That's the other side of the profit issue. And to get costs, we want to think about this firm's production function again. Remember, the production function is a technical term. All it does is tell you how many pumpkins, and more generally, how much output uh, you get from a certain amount of labor. It relates the firm's output, in our case pumpkins, to the firm's inputs, in this case, the labor. Here's an example. Focus first on the first two columns. The first, very first column gives you the quantity produced by the farmer in crates. The second is how much labor it takes to produce the crates. We're given an example in terms of hours. And so, as you can see, the more crates that are produced, the more hours of labor are required. One crate takes two hours, five crates takes 30 hours, etc. That's what we mean by the production function, just simply that relationship. Now, once you have that relationship, you then can begin to think about the cost of production. So, for example, suppose it costs $10 an hour for the workers that are on this farm. Then, for two hours of work, it's going to be $20. That's shown in the third column. For 10 hours of work, it's $100. 30 hours of work, it's $300, and so on. So we've labeled this labor cost in the third column. And we're calling it variable costs because it varies depending on how much labor comes into the process. There's also the fixed cost, which is the amount that the farmer had to pay in advance for the land, or for a section of the land, or whatever it happens to be. And we're going to assume it's fixed because during this growing season, the farmer has already invested that amount, and that's a fixed cost. It doesn't change when you hire more or fewer workers. In this case, it's 50. And then finally, to get your total cost, you add up the variable costs and the fixed costs. In this case, 0 plus 50 is 50, total cost is 50. If you produce no pumpkins, as in that first row, you still got to pay the fixed cost, which is $50. And then and so on. For the case of one pumpkin, you hire two um, hours of work, one item, two hours of work. The cost is $10 an hour, that's $20. Your fixed cost is $50, and then summing across, you get $70, and so on. So you can see now how total costs depend on the amount of workers that are hired and those workers are producing the output. Now let's look more carefully at this costs idea. So what this table does is just takes the quantity of pumpkins produced in the first column, one, two, three, four, five. It looks at the total cost, which we just computed, 50, 70, 100, et cetera, and it looks at this other concept, a new concept, which we're going to call marginal cost. Marginal cost is the additional cost it takes to produce one more pumpkin. So for example, if you produce one pumpkin rather than none, the marginal cost is 20 because it, it costs $70 rather than $50. If you produce three pumpkins rather than two, your costs rise from 100 to 150, and that's a marginal cost of 50. So that's the definition of marginal cost, and it's going to be really important for us to determine how much the producer, in this case the farmer, will produce. Now, given all this put together, let's use our profit maximization idea to derive the supply curve. And to do this, we're going to go through a series of steps. First, we're going to plot the marginal cost for the firm. Then we're going to imagine the firm considers different prices. And then we're going to find the quantity supplied at each price. And then after all that, the result you'll see will be the supply curve. So let's look at a graph that illustrates this. This graph has quantity supplied by the farmer in crates on the horizontal axis. It has the dollars, which are going to be the cost of production, on the vertical axis. And we've looked at marginal costs and quantity already in the table, so now we just need to plot the points. Let's do that. So if you recall, the marginal cost for one pumpkin is 20. Then it goes up, 30, and goes up, 4, and then the highest marginal cost is 5. 
Now note, the marginal costs are increasing. We saw that in the table, now we're seeing that in the picture. Now what we want to do is ask ourselves, if these are the marginal costs of the farmer, how many pumpkins will the farmer produce depending on the price? So let's first suppose the price is you know, around somewhere between zero and $20. Our prediction would be that the farmer wouldn't produce any pumpkins. Suppose the price is $10. And in that case, the, the marginal cost of producing one pumpkin is $20. If the price is $10, the cost is greater than the price, it makes no sense to produce that pumpkin. But then when the price gets to $20, or maybe one cent above $20 to make it simple, then the farmer realized, well, producing that pumpkin, the marginal cost is 20. I'm getting $20 in one cent, say, and so I'm going to produce that pumpkin. And then suppose the price rises some more, say, to $21, $22. Does he produce two pumpkins? No, because the marginal cost of a second pumpkin is 30. It's not until the price gets to 30 that the farmer will say, okay, two pumpkins, I'll do that. And that represents the quantity decision by the farmer. And you can continue to do this, continue raising the price and seeing how much will be produced. When the price rises, you'll see those, the quantity supplied increases. And there you go, right through that. And so what we've done, if you think about it, is we've derived a supply curve. It's a description of how many pumpkins the farmer will produce at different prices. It's upward sloping, just like we think the supply curve should be. And it's upward sloping because of the marginal cost curve, marginal cost rising as in the picture. Now sometimes these steps look a little strange. That's because there's a, a discrete amount of crates that can be produced. Obviously they could produce somewhere between 1 and 2 or 1.6. So this is an example that doesn't illustrate that. But so more generally, we draw a more smooth line through the points to illustrate that uh, phenomenon. And there is the typical supply curve where we've connected the points without those step functions, imagining that the quantity produced can be in between. In any case, we've now derived the supply curve from the basic idea of profit maximization. The farmer looking at the amount to produce, it should get the highest level of profits. Now let's think a little bit about what has come out of this derivation. Some very important things. First of all, if you think about the graph, you'll see that the decision the farmers made has, made the marginal, has been to make the marginal cost equal to the price. The firm chooses a quantity to produce such that marginal cost equals to the price. That was the, clear in the dots in the previous diagram and in the smooth curve as well. When an economist like me sees a supply curve, we actually think of marginal costs. Not the usual way you might think of it, but it's marginal cost, and it slopes upward because of the marginal cost. The exact reason why supply curves slope upward is because marginal costs are increasing. And marginal costs increasing is a very important aspect of the supply curve. Now, we want to also consider a couple of other things before we move away from this derivation. First is this important concept of producer surplus. Producer surplus is by definition the area above the supply curve and below the price. It represents the fact that the farmer is getting more than the marginal cost for production below the amount uh, that's actually decided upon. And you can illustrate this in the picture as well. So that's, there's our picture of the supply curve we just derived. And now I'm going to drive in a, draw in a price, in this case the price is $70. And there's some interesting things that come out of this picture as we've looked at it. So there's the price of $70. We know at this price that the uh, farmer will produce three items. The marginal cost curve is telling us that. And the area below the price above the supply curve now is what we're calling the producer surplus. And it's a surplus because if you think about it, the farmer is getting $70 for that first item. It only costs $20 to produce. If you look over and to the left of that diagram, the left part of the shaded area, you see a price of 70 and the marginal cost of 20. So the farmer has gotten an extra $50, and we're going to call that the consumer surplus. For the next item produced, it's slightly less because the marginal cost is higher. And for the third item produced, even less because the marginal cost is still higher yet. 
But in each case, you can see there's a, a extra, and that's this producer surplus. And it's going to be really important when we consider why markets work well and when they don't work well. Now, the last thing I want to do is derive the market supply curve. The market supply curve considers all the firms in the markets. It's Once we've got the individual firm supply curve, it's pretty straightforward. Just add up the quantity supplied by all the firms at each price to get the market supply curve. In a sense, this addition is horizontal across the diagram, as the diagram, which I'll show you now, illustrates clearly. So what we're doing is, in this picture, is putting in two individual supply curves, one on the upper left and one on the upper right. You can think of the one on the upper left as Fred's supply curve, and the one on the upper right as your own supply curve, so depending you're the CEO of this farm. Now, we've derived the supply curves for marginal costs, so let's do that for Fred and yourself. Well, there's Fred and there's you. Notice each of you, as we go through here, these dots are producing a certain amount of pumpkins depending on the price. So those dots which have come into the picture illustrate that. Now let's look at this graph carefully now that the dots are plotted. You notice that Fred is producing one pumpkin when the price is 20. So are you. You're producing one pumpkin when the price is 20 over on the right. The sum of you together are producing therefore two pumpkins at that price of $20. And we plotted that in the diagram at the bottom. The diagram at the bottom is the market. It's the total amount of, of supply in the market. So as you can see, just to repeat, at $20, 1 plus 1 is 2. Now, if the price is higher, up there at around $30, then you're going to produce 2. So is Fred. So 2 plus 2 is 4. So now you've got 4 for the market. And so on, as you add your production and Fred's production at different prices, and that's what I mean by horizontally adding at different prices, you get this market supply curve. And the market supply curve is what we were seeking to derive in this lecture. And you can see it comes from these basic ideas of people and firms maximizing profits with the production function and then adding up for each firm in the market. Thank you.